All right. Good morning. This is Christina Cologne, your task force co-chair. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you also for participating in the previous webinar on the online GIS tool and avoidance and attraction areas last month. We appreciated the discussion we had that day and the feedback you provided on the webinar format. We have incorporated your input to adjust the format for today's webinar. So why are we having these webinars? The intent is to resume the face-to-face -face task force meetings when executive orders allow. We know there may still be travel restrictions based on your own personal concerns and your own organizational policies. We will work toward a solution that will accommodate everyone on the task force and the public. The webinar series are designed to keep the task force members engaged in important topics while being mindful of time commitments. You can see our content duration is kept to about an hour, then Q&A. We appreciate your patience as we continue to improve both our task force meeting and public engagement efforts. I also want to thank the many task force members who have and will take time to participate in the technical briefing with staff on the online GIS tool. The purpose of the technical briefings is to provide a tutorial for the task force members on how to use the GIS tool, which is available on the MCORS website for all, and get feedback on avoidance and attraction layers. We ask that the task force members use this tool as they prepare for our next in-person task force meeting where the discussion and feedback will be open as always. Hopefully these briefings are helpful as you think about the avoidance and attraction areas the high level needs and the development of the guiding principles. We will provide an updated tool and layers prior to our next in-person meeting and then discuss as a group whether any additional refinements are needed at that time. The same tool is available online to the public, so I want to encourage members of the public to review and provide their suggestions as well. I also want to thank the many members of the public who provided their public comments during the last webinar, as well as those who continue to provide comments via email, letters, and other formats. I want to continue to emphasize how important this input is to the process. As we are all learning how to refine our process in a virtual environment, we clarified the registration process since the last webinar. We will accommodate all who registered by 5 p.m. yesterday and want to speak. Public comment during our meetings and webinars is only one way for the public to provide their input. Public comments may be submitted at any time to f.listens at dot.state.fl.us and will become part of the public record. Task force members are encouraged to remain engaged through the course of the public comment period today. The purpose of today's webinar is to provide some additional background information to you on another topic, emerging technology trends. The MCORS statute encourages consideration of autonomous, connected, electric, and shared vehicle technology, as well as mobility as a service. We have not spent a lot of time on these topics at our meetings, so we'd like to take some time today to give you background information on these topics. The agenda includes a brief presentation from FDOT staff, followed by a panel discussion on potential opportunities for using these technologies to support a major transportation corridor. Like with other subject matter experts during our in-person meetings, we want to encourage you to take this time to ask questions and to consider the implications of these technologies for the corridor, high-level needs, and guiding principles. We will leave time at the end of the panel to engage to allow for questions and answers. We have received many questions about when our next in-person meeting will take place. At this point, we are abiding by the Governor's Executive Order Number 20-112 safe, smart, step-by-step -step plan for Florida's recovery. We anticipate scheduling our next in-person meeting once we are at the stage where we can convene groups of that size. Our intent remains for task force meetings six through nine to all occur in person. 
we will be in touch with you as soon as we have any specifics about when these meetings might occur. Until we meet again in person, we plan to continue using webinars to engage with you, the task force members, and to continue to hear the public's voice. Now I will ask our facilitator, Christine Kefauver, to make a few announcements. Thank you, Christina. It is great that we're able to meet again, even though it has to be virtually and not yet in person. I'm gonna talk about the public comment period, the logistics for the webinar, meeting objectives, the agenda, and provide a brief Florida sunshine reminder. The public comment period will begin at 10.45 this morning as soon as or as soon as we are done with the task force member Q&A. And I will say the last couple of meetings, that's been a very robust conversation. So it may go a little bit later. So please bear with us. Requests to comment were received by five o'clock yesterday afternoon and will be addressed during the public comment period in the order in which they were received. When your name is called, we will unmute your line in order for you to provide comment within your allotted time of three minutes. Only one person at a time will be unmuted. If you've self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. If you did not submit your request in time to be able to speak today, please email your comments to florida.listens at dot.state.fl.us. The webinar is being recorded and will be available with other materials on the MCORS website. You will remain muted for the entirety of the presentation. We will unmute task force members one at a time during the question and answer period. Again, only one person at a time will be unmuted. If you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. For the question and answer period, we will unmute all task force members one at a time in a single round in the order in which you can see the attendees on the list. Please don't put the webinar on hold or take another call because I think we're gonna hear your music, your whole music. And one last note, we may have adjusted your username in order to readily identify you as a task force member in order to unmute your line. Please do not make any changes to your username so that you may be heard during roll call and the Q&A period. All right, so the objectives for today. We're gonna to receive a briefing on emerging technology trends and opportunities. We're gonna discuss implications of these emerging technologies for corridor development, and as you know, receive public comment. So here's our agenda for this morning. We're gonna start off at 9.45 for a presentation. The public comment period, as we've mentioned, is scheduled for 1045, but we'll start it as soon as the other agenda items are completed. We've received 19 responses to speak. That will take about an hour, and we hope that all task force members will be able to stay on the line. Okay, so here's our government in the sunshine notice here. Today, we'll have a short reminder of your requirements. Generally speaking, task force members should not communicate verbally, email, or via third party to any other task force member on items under consideration of the task force. You may, of course, communicate on matters unrelated to the task force topics. We have Diane on the line with us today, Diane Guimet from the Office of the Attorney General as well, and she can answer any questions regarding Sunshine Law as it relates to the task force when we get to the Q&A portion of the agenda. So, all task force members were given a unique link to sign in, and as task force members logged on, we did our very best to recognize who has joined us. Um, I'll now read through the names and organizations and note who is present and who is not in attendance. We do realize that these are unique times and many of our task force members have other responsibilities as part of their full-time job. Some have sent um, alternates as well today and we'll recognize them. If you are a substitute and we didn't rec recognize your attendance, please send an email to Jennifer. All right. So you've heard we have our, our co-chair Christina Colon from the Florida Department of Transportation is here. 
We have James Stansberry. He's here standing in for Mario Rubio for the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. Jason Height is here for Chris Wynn with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Mark Futrell is here for the Public Service Commission. Tim Vanderhoof from Enterprise Florida is not able to join us today. We do have Commissioner Jeff Kennard from the Hernando Citrus Metropolitan Planning Organization. He's also with Citrus uh, County. Scott Coons is here from the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council. We have Charles Lee with us this morning from Audubon, Florida. Kent Wimmer is here from Defenders of the Wildlife. Commissioner Scott Carnahan is here from the Citrus County Commission. James Mayer is here from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Nancy Brown is not able to join us this morning. She's with the Department of Education. Michael Napier is here from the Florida Department of Health. Mayor Matt Surrency is here representing the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Jim Patton has joined us and he represents the Department of Business and Professional Regulations. Rusty Skinner represents Career Source and he is not able to join us this morning. Commissioner Kathy Bryant with Marion County Commission has not been able to join us this morning. Once again, recognizing of these unique times as well. We have Ashley Stefanik representing Warren Zwanka with the Swanee River Water Management District. And Frank Gargano is here for Jeanette Seacrest with the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Jeanette does have a conflict of her schedule and she will join as soon as she can for this webinar. Commissioner Rock Meeks is not able to join us from Lee County Commission. Sean Sullivan is here from the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Bradley Arnold is here representing Sumter County. Phil Fulmer is here representing the Florida Trucking Association. Chris Saliba is here for the Florida Rural Water Association. Bill Ferry is with the Florida Internet and Television Association. Danielle Ruiz is here representing the Florida Economic Development Council. Kurt Williams is here representing the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. Dr. Lauder with the College of Central Florida is not able to join us this morning. Dr. Stanley Sider is here representing the Lake Sumter State College. Paul Owens has joined us from a thousand friends of Florida. Jason Lauritsen is here with the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Zach Prusak is here representing the Nature Conservancy. Hugh Harling is here with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. And lastly, um, Katie Tronesco is not able to join us from Volunteer Florida. So that concludes our, our roll call, sh shall we say. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Raj Penalori. He uh, and he's going to talk about connected vehicle and arterial management. He's an engineer at FDOT, and he'll take us through today's presentation. <laughs> we are going to use the webinar component of this so that you can see our panelists as we go through this morning. So, Raj, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to speak to the panel this morning. Uh, Florida DOT's uh, vision is to provide a congestion-free and a fatality-free transportation system. A significant number of traffic crashes occur due to human error, and our goal is to apply technology to drive towards Vision Zero. Florida DOT has not only developed, but also adopted a connected and automated vehicle business plan, or the CAV business plan as we call it, in the year 2019. Uh, this document was developed in partnership with several entities from across the state of Florida and in coordination with the Federal Highway Administration. This document draws upon many of the department's adopted plans, such as 
the Florida Transportation Plan, the Strategic Intermodal System Plan, the Strategic Highway Safety Plan, uh, the IPS Plan, and others as well. The program's goal is to make it cut across vehicle types and technology types. The business plan document really focuses on seven focus areas. Policies and governance refers to the institutionalization and a framework to not only plan, but also design and deploy emerging technologies in Florida. Program funding, on the other hand, discusses work prioritization, opportunities that exist with technology and the resource needs. Education outreach presents a need for unified messaging, increased awareness about technology and workforce development. Industry outreach, on the other hand, discusses collaborations and the strategic partnerships that are required. Technology standards and specifications de development, on the other hand, assists with the need for preparing the infrastructure going forward, while implementation readiness really focuses on how technology can be leveraged in a connected vehicle environment in the state of Florida. Lastly, deployment and implementation is truly the goal of the department. This is necessary to realize the full-scale safety and mobility benefits to be gained from technology implementation. There are several projects that are underway. The key infrastructure initiatives include the signal phase and timing, or the SPAC, signal phase and timing projects in Tallahassee, Gainesville, and Pinellas County, and the I-75 frame, or Florida's Regional Advanced Mobility Elements frame projects. Mr. Trey Tillender is going to speak about this later on. Often we get questions about what are connected vehicles, what are automated vehicles, and autonomous vehicles. So just real quick to distinguish among those three, connected vehicles refer to applications, services, and technology which connect a vehicle to its surroundings, and therefore situational awareness is what it happens. Connected is all about hearing and communication. Automated vehicles, on the other hand, are equipped with technology, sensors, and other features which provide the ability to provide safety alerts to the drivers and all modes out there. In other words, automated is about system capability. Autonomous vehicles, on the other hand, talk about the capability of sensing the environment and navigating along the travel direction without human inter intervention or input. So autonomous vehicles are all about seeing, detecting, and responding in real time. Currently, there are 25 initiatives in the state of Florida. Some are through collaboration with other entities or external entities, such as the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority in the Tampa Bay region. Here is just one example of a concept called the Gainesville Bicycle Pedestrian Safety Project. This project is being developed by, this, by Florida Department of Transportation and focuses on bike bed safety. Passively detecting pedestrians, in other words, detecting without the devices itself, is one way of effecting changes to the traffic signals and mid-block crosswalks, and this is being explored. Promoting multimodalism with a focus on freight, transit, and bicycle pedestrian safety is really important to the Florida DOT. Several projects are being developed, of course, with the goal of increasing safety, enhancing mobility, and inspiring innovation. These kind of projects help to reduce vehicle stops, vehicle delays, and therefore also reduce vehicular emissions to promote air quality and achieve environmental improvement significantly. These projects also provide opportunities to deploy emerging technologies with safe and efficient transportation system for all road users and just not the vehicles. Here is just one slide which shows uh, the type of technology equipment out in the field. You see the roadside units, onboard units, cameras, etc. These are only some of the examples of the field devices. These devices provide connectivity to vehicles in all modes, and they enable technology implementation. And from these devices, we can not only collect information, but we can also broadcast the necessary detail to promote safety and mobility for all users. Florida DOT is engaged significantly in what is called the ACES program, which stands for Automated, Connected, Electric, and Shared. This program provides knowledge and information on automated, connected, electric, shared aspects of uh, connected vehicle technologies. This also delves into what is called shared mobility. And by shared mobility, we mean a variety of transportation modes, including car sharing, bike sharing, peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing, on-demand rider services, microtransit, and other modes being served. Florida DOT is building partnerships 
with shared mobility technology providers to provide such opportunities for all transportation users. The V2X, which stands for Vehicle to Everything Data Exchange Platform, is all about collecting data, packaging the data, which is analyzing the data, and providing it to car companies or, and anyone who wants to use it to provide that information to road users. This is to provide traffic and traveler information in real time to reduce crashes and improve vehicular flows. SCMS provides an in, uh, uh, initial security platform. SCMS stands for Security Credential Management System with message content and the source of those messages. TAPS LA, or the Technology Applications Partnership for Local Agencies, and ISTRI, these are two major initiatives the department is undertaking. Um, FDOT will partner with local agencies on technology projects as a part of TAPS LA. On the other hand, Florida DOT is also working on an industry outreach called the I Street in partnership with the University of Florida. Freight happens to be one of the focus areas in all transportation systems, especially at the Florida DOT. As you can see on the slide, it supports economic development, helps reduce travel times, improve mobility, etc. Uh, this is a thrust area for the department. Florida DOT plans to explore the use of technology to support the freight industry. This will help improve travel times and advance safety systems significantly. Technologies similar to these are being discussed elsewhere and will be applied wherever possible, especially freight. Work zones, developing and implementing work zones with technology applications is another thrust area. Providing real-time information to both motorists and workers in work zones will help reduce crashes and improve mobility. This is a brief video clip while the clip is running let me mention about the fact that this is a system called the autonomous truck mounted attenuator. The autonomous truck mounted attenuator operates without a driver following a lead vehicle and this helps improve safety of all the road users, especially those in the work zones. So it helps reduce workplace injuries and saves human lives. We want to thank you for the opportunity to present on the Florida DOT's technology program. Technology offers a good value addition to all road users and maximizes the safety and mobility benefits and really helps to optimize the existing road infrastructure. We want to thank you for this opportunity and I'm uh, back to you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. And before we get into the panel discussion, I do need to apologize. I overlooked, we have three additional task force members that I, overlooked in the roll call that are here and should be recognized. Jeff Prather with the St. John's River Water Management District, Mike Woods with the Lake Sumter MPO, and Vice Mayor Valerie Hancher. She represents the Ocala Marion County Transportation Planning Organization. So I do apologize for not mentioning those during the original roll call. They are all present. So back to our panel discussion. Um, today, following the emerging technology experts, we've ag they've agreed to participate and answer questions that the task force members may have. Like at pre previous meetings, they will provide a brief description of their background and area of expertise. So we're very fortunate to have four panelists this morning. Trey Talander, he's the director of the Florida Department of Transportation, Traffic Engineering and Operations. Dr. Lilly. Lefterando, she's the director of the University of Florida Transportation Institute. We have Doc, Doug Kettles, the director of Central Florida Clean Water Coalition, and Jovan Zagiats, the technology manager with the Florida Smart Mobility Division of the Florida Motor Company. So they're each going to do a short presentation that you will all be able to participate view and then we'll open it up for some questions and answers of the task force members so let me hand it over to you trey thank you christine good morning I, i'm the florida department of transportation's director of traffic engineering and operations and also state traffic operations engineer and i appreciate the opportunity to talk today about fdot's connected and automated vehicle initiative I will pick up where Raj left off and describe some CAV projects pertinent to the Northern Turnpike Connector. 
I'll start off with the high level objectives, applications, and benefits of FDOT's Connected and Automated Vehicle Initiative. And then I'll go, then go through some of FDOT's CAV projects, beginning with some regional efforts and diving down into some local projects. The objectives of FDOT's Connected and Automated Vehicle Initiative are safety, mobility, and economic development. Every FDOT CAV project strives to achieve these objectives consistent with the department's mission and vision. The CAV program's vision is a fatality-free and congestion-free transportation system. I do want to emphasize our safety objective. For every CAV effort, we always start with asking, what can we do to improve safety? This slide shows the 2018 crash numbers and fatalities statewide and for the Northern Turnpike Connector area. Data from the U.S. Department of Transportation tells us that 94% of the time, the reason for a traffic crash is the human driver. Since traditional safety countermeasures typically deal with the roadway and not the human, they can only improve safety so much. We feel that to get to zero fatalities, we must implement innovative technologies like connected and automated vehicles. Connected and automated vehicle technology has a wide range of applications, and here are a few examples on this slide. Emergency vehicle preemption reduces delay for emergency vehicles, creates signal priority, improves travel time for trucks by reducing delay at traffic signals. And autonomous shuttles have great potential to increase transportation mobility, particularly for the elderly, low income, and disabled. Florida is one of the most advanced states regarding the implementation of connected and automated vehicle technology. This state map is on FDOT's website and shows the many CAV projects that we are involved in. In the next three slides, I'll go into some of the regional and local projects. One of the largest CAV efforts in Florida and the country is FDOT's FRAME initiative. FRAME stands for Florida's Regional Advanced Mobility Element. There are currently four frame projects in Florida, two on I-75, one on I-4, and one on US-41 in Southwest Florida. Within the Northern Turnpike Connector area, I-75 frame and Ocala will bring many safety and mobility benefits to I-75 travelers, as well as users of the arterial corridors that parallel I-75. These experiences can be applied back to the connector corridor. Florida's transportation system has seen a significant increase in commercial vehicle truck traffic over the years. Florida's rest areas and way stations experience overflow parking at some locations, while others remain underutilized. This led FDOT to develop a statewide truck parking availability system to assist truck drivers in identifying available parking locations. The parking information is displayed on road, roadside dynamic message panels and is accessible through the Florida 501 website and phone apps. We are also working with third-party app providers to get the parking information displayed in vehicle inside the truck cab. This slide shows a few of the pertinent CAV projects that could be leveraged by the Northern Turnpike Connector. In addition to the I-4 and I-75 frame projects, there's ongoing autonomous vehicle testing in the villages. Also, SunTracks will be Florida's state-of-the-art facility for testing CAV technologies and applications. SunTracks is located on 475 acres in Polk County and has a 2.25-mile oval test track with a 200-acre infield. The SunTracks facility will allow high-speed CAV and tolling tests, as well as many intersection-based CAV test scenarios. I hope this gives you a taste of the potential for connected and automated vehicle technologies to improve transportation safety and mobility. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions during the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Trey. Next, we'll hear for doc from Dr. Lily Electorado of University of Florida. She'll give us an overview on their program, iStreet. Good morning. 
My name is Lilia Lasteriado. I'm the director of the University of Florida Transportation Institute and a professor in civil engineering. I want to thank Eftot and the uh, organizers for inviting me to speak about the I Street uh, Real World Testbed. Um, this is a very exciting time for transportation uh, with autonomy, connectivity, sensors, and big data analytics. Um, I Street is a collaboration between the Florida Department of Transportation, the city of Gainesville, and the University of Florida. Uh, and it's a, it's a real world testbed for developing, implementing, and evaluating uh, advanced transportation technologies. The idea about iStreet originated in 2016 um, when we began to develop a strategic plan. Uh, we completed this strategic plan in uh, September 2017, and the project was uh, funded by uh, FDOT. Now, I'll share some highlights of our ongoing projects uh, with iStreet, uh, but I want to start with um, answering the question, why in Gainesville? Um, well, it's, a, it's a really an ideal place for testing. We have pedestrians, bicycles, uh, scooters, um, one of the best used transit systems in the state, um, and we have a younger population, um, typically more amenable to using advanced technologies. Uh, one of our um, important projects um, is the autonomous vehicle shuttle shown here on the video, which is operating in downtown Gainesville. Um, this video shows the shuttle when it was my mapping the route in downtown Gainesville, and you see the so the bicyclist um, running along while the shuttle is getting ready to to pull over, um, and uh, and the vehicle stops. Um, it uses its onboard sensors to detect obstacles um, and to stop very quickly um, when needed. So this is the type of technology we hope will be deployed on, uh, on all vehicles to, to reduce um, crashes. Um, the EV shuttle started operating on fe uh, February 3rd, but is now on hold temporarily. Um, as part of I Street, uh, there's extensive instrumentation around the UF campus um, and uh, Raj and, and Trey mentioned some of those projects. Um, and uh, the, um, the, the instrumentation allows for several mobility and, and safety applications um, that are based on, um, on connectivity. Um, there's instrumentation along the I-75, the frame project uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and the uh, top um, center shows the um, trapezium project, uh, bottom center on campus shows the pedestrian safety related uh, applications evaluation. Um, we are also leveraging other resources to increase the impact of I Street. Um, and this video shows an example that's related to a project that's funded by the National Science Foundation, where we use sensors to detect vehicle arrivals to optimize signal control. Um, we detect vehicles arriving, we calculate what is the best path to minimize their delay, and we send it back to the vehicle. The dots you see show the optimal path, and the lines show the actual path. Uh, this works with autonomous vehicles, with connected vehicles, and it can also work with, uh, with conventional vehicles. Another project is a partnership of the University of Florida with the city of Gainesville, and we received the National Science Foundation funding to develop algorithms for using video to detect near misses. This allows us to evaluate an intersection without waiting for, for crashes to happen. And we're also seeking industry partnership. We're working with, with several companies uh, with an interest in, uh, in I Street. So when, when things start to open up, I invite you to come visit us in, in Gainesville, learn more about I Street and um, this uh, unique partnership we have, uh, not aware of any other similar ones around the country, um, to improve mobility and safety um, through our partnerships with, with industry and the, and the public sector and through leveraging uh, resources. Uh, thank you again for the invite and looking forward to responding to questions. Thank you, Dr. Lilly. Next, we'll hear from Doug Kettles. He's with the he's the director of the Central Florida Clean Cities Coalition, and he's going to talk about the Florida Electric Vehicle Roadmap. Doug.
Doug, we can't hear you. Doug, you're self-muted. Could you try that again, please? There you go. Doug, we still cannot hear you. While we work through that technical difficulty, should we go on to Yovan? Doug, can you hear us? See, even the technology experts have challenges. All right, we're gonna go on to Yovan. Yovan is the technology manager for Florida Smart Mobility Division. Um, thank you for joining us today. And he's gonna talk about Florida Smart Mobility, Ford Smart Mobility, sorry. Thank you, Christine. Um, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, good morning, all. Um, at Ford, my primary responsibility is to keep an eye on emerging connected vehicle technologies and uh, when appropriate, uh, bring them into our products. Uh, we believe just like many in the transportation industry do, that connectivity is one of the key enablers for addressing our mobility and safety challenges. We also believe that vehicle to everything technology is the next chapter in the evolution of vehicle connectivity, uh, which promises to deliver some exciting safety improvements and experiences. I will not dwell on the salient characteristics and potentials of connected vehicle technologies as previous speakers have done uh, so, uh, and they've done a great job in doing so. Uh, instead, I will just say that we have been collaborating with our peers and the US Department of Transportation on this technology since the early 2000s and are convinced in its value. It is for this reason, as this uh, slide is showing, that we are aggressively expanding our core cellular-based connectivity across the Ford lineup. We will have 100% of new vehicles in the US connected and more than 90% of new global vehicles connected by the end of this year. In peril, we are undertaking the fundamental change in electrical vehicle architecture so that beginning in this year, our new vehicles will be capable of over-the-air updates. This will allow us to maintain our vehicle software safe and up-to-date. We are also committed to deploying cellular V2X technology in the US in all our new vehicle models beginning in 2022, uh, provided the regulatory environment is conducive for us to do so. I said cellular V2X technology, so what is that? Uh, well, uh, let me start by saying that cellular and cellular V2X is a bit of a misnomer. When people think of cellular devices, what comes to their mind first are cell towers, SIM cards, um, and very expensive data plans. Uh, cellular V2X technology does provide the traditional network connectivity that we have in smartphones and many vehicles on the road today. But in addition to this, uh, they also have the capability for direct communication where vehicles can talk directly to other vehicles and their surroundings, such as traffic lights, pedestrians, scooters, um, all this without requiring cell towers or data plans to function. In this mode, uh, cellular devices operate like walkie-talkies. This technology will help us deliver our vision of smart vehicles in a smart world, which at Ford is our North Star. If you pause for a moment to think about it, neither the vehicles nor the world will be very smart if they cannot communicate with each other. We are excited about working with states like yours that understand this potential and are willing to collaborate with us on delivering a future of smarter, safer, and more efficient mobility. Finally, I want to thank you for the opportunity to tell you about our plans, and I'm looking forward to responding to any questions you may have about our connected vehicle efforts. Uh, Christine, back to you. Thank you so much, and thanks for your flexibility here. Um, 
we're uh, still checking on technology. It looks like we're able to get um, Doug back on. Doug, can you hear us now? Doug, we cannot hear you quite yet. I appreciate everybody's patience through this. All right, it appears as if we're not able to get Doug on the line and it's a shame. Um, if, for those task force members, you can always go back. We've taped his presentation from the other panelists as well. So Will, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Yeah, we apologize about that. We just uh, try to do our best to make sure we stay connected and and lots of little things can happen. But good morning. This is Will Watts, Chief Engineer for FDOT, and I've got Wei Wei Shen. She's the Chief Planner here with me. We just want to thank the panel for your time and expertise today. It's, it's exciting to see how quickly technologies are changing and the possibilities this creates for us. As we mentioned in the start of the meeting, most of the pilot projects we've got going on now are in early development and mostly in the urban areas so far. So you have an opportunity to give us guidance on how to explore these technologies for these study areas. Let us share a few examples with you and just kind of start thinking. How could we improve safety by reducing driver error and enable more rapid responses? How could we improve mobility if we're able to get the word out to motorists about rerouting options more quickly? How could we improve commercial vehicle safety and efficiency by providing truck drivers with real-time information. This is an opportunity for us to think and ask about how we would like the corridors in, the, in these areas to function in the future. So hopefully we can get Doug online here. We're, we're gonna turn the videos on, but you got a great panel of experts here. So Christine, I think we're ready for questions. Thank you. Well, now we can see Doug. Here's our panelists. So. All right, so task force members, um, I, I hope you've enjoyed the, the presentations from our panelists this morning. And we're gonna go down the list and you can actually see your name in the attendees and I'll unmute you one at a time um, to ask questions of our panelists. And we're gonna start with you, uh, co-chair, Christina Colon. Let me. Okay. Uh, well, Christine, I don't have any questions, uh, but I do want to take this moment to really thank the staff for pulling this webinar together and especially these panel members for their time and effort to educate all of us on such an interesting topic. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go down the list. And first we have James Stansberry. He's here um, representing Mario Rubio in the Department of Economic Opportunity. James, I'm gonna unmute you. Thank you, good morning. Um, I've attended the last two MCOR meetings earlier this week and I've had the pleasure of listening to this panel and have really appreciated it. Um, got a question and I wanted to give Raj the opportunity and perhaps uh, Weiwei to uh, chime in also on how land use planning can uh, be a part of this effort. So I'll leave that up to Raj. And uh, if Weiwei wants to weigh in also, great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Great. <clears throat> Excellent question. We appreciate the question. Um, yes, land use planning, uh, as we understand today, it is likely to change uh, in a rather evolutionary way. It is going to be more organic in the sense that when we look at whether it is the interstate facilities or I mean the limited access facilities and the adjoining arterial system, obviously where the electric vehicle um, uh, charging stations are going to be located, where are the vehicles going to turn in and therefore how is the access manage management going to work? Where will the residential communities choose to stay in relation to the uh, technology provision. So all these things are very likely to uh, uh, modify, but in a very gradual way. As we speak, there's something called the integrated corridor management, which talks about how freeways connect with arterial systems. 
that is also going to have a significant impact on technology and vice versa and therefore land use planning going forward. Um, in fact, if we look at the university settings, for instance, the student communities would be positively affected with technology when they have smartphones and as they're walking, their safety is going to improve and therefore the adjoining developments in terms of shared mobility, how far people want to drive in their vehicles, etc. So yes, there is likely going to be a change and fortunately from a planning perspective, experts like Weiwei Shen's office, they're all looking at things of this type from a technology perspective. Um, last point, the ACES slide was specifically meant for that. The automated connected electric shared is probably the closest to land use planning when it comes to emerging technologies and CAD. So fortunately, we are at the front end of doing this work. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Raj. And I, I forgot to mention that Weiwei is available to answer any questions, as is uh, Jennifer along the way. So we're all available here for you virtually. So next up, we have uh, Jason Height with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation. I'm going to unmute you if you have a question. Um, I, if, if everybody can hear me OK, um, yes. I, uh, I didn't really have any specific questions. I really appreciate the panelists' time. This is my first time to hear the presentation. Um, I think our only you know, specific interest, and it's more of a curiosity than some requirement or you know, a game changing question was we have at least two big hot spots, big uh, geographic chunks of the state that are kind of wildlife corridors. We have panther speed zones, bear speed zones, and I wondered if the uh, autonomous vehicle technology it, you know reacts the same to those areas in like a grand sense, and then actual you know an actual uh, animal crossing a highway much like a pedestrian if they had that same reaction or if that's even been tested so trey would you like to answer that uh, sure and um the same techno thank you for the question it's it's a good question um the same technologies that um detect um pedestrians bicyclists that um automakers are including in their vehicles um, can can also detect animals. So the sensor detection, and there's different technologies that different sensors are getting better and better. And so absolutely, we, we do expect that will be a benefit to uh, wildlife as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mark Futrell with the Florida Public Service Commission. Mark, I'm gonna mute you for a question. Thank you, Christine. Good morning. Thank you for the presentations. I, I do not have a question, but I would just comment that the PSC has been monitoring uh, electric vehicles for several years, and we will continue to uh, monitor the impact of electric vehicle charging on the reliability of the electric grid. Thank you. Excellent. Next, we have Commissioner um, Kennard with the Hernando Citrus Metropolitan Planning Organization. Commissioner, I'm going to unmute you if you have a question. No, I don't have a question, just enjoying the discussion. It's um, very interesting. Obviously, um, uh, the connected and automated vehicles are here and, and growing, and uh, it'll be, uh, be interesting to see all of this develop. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Scott Coons. Did you have a question of the panel? Um, yes, I do, Christina. I just have a two-part question. Uh, the first part is, one if the panels could speak to the opportunity for being able to increase uh, capacity and usage of existing roadways as connected and automated vehicles uh, become more common on the highway by allowing uh, platoons to closer the vehicles to, in platoons to travel closer together. The second part is to speak to the challenge as Older dumb cars remain on the highway and are part of the fleet and may interfere with the ability of connected vehicles to operate efficiently. Thank you. All right, we've got three who want to speak. Raj, you want to kick it off? Uh, sure, uh, th thank you. Another great question and uh, real quick, going back to the previous question about land use planning, which kind of ties back to this one as well, whether it is the transit oriented developments or freight planning or bicycle pedestrian paths and trails and things of the type. 
And that comes right into this question because as we think more and more about land use planning, for instance, and the more we get into modal mix, as we call that. So on the roadway, you have not only these emerging technology or technology accrued vehicles, but also the traditional fleet. And this is going to continue for quite some time. So I think all of us as a challenge, I think the question is great because the word challenge was brought out. This is going to be a challenge for the short and medium term in the sense that we are not going to have technology equipped vehicles immediately. And that means how do we grapple with this situation? Fortunately, the industry, the car companies and states like the Florida DOT are already thinking ahead in terms of how to handle the safety and mobility aspects in a multimodal mix, so to say. Uh, in terms of capacity improvements, we always see technology as a value add. It is only an addition to an existing roadway infrastructure in the sense that capacity can actually improve given what is already out there. So yes, as platoons get closer, however, it is going to take a while before we see those significant benefits. And that means as we move, we need to start thinking about how technology integrates with our current systems and utilize what we already have out there whether it is the existing roadway infrastructure or technology system. So yes, these are questions we continuously think about and, and make sure we provide the right solutions to all road users at the end of the day. Thank you. Excellent. Yovanne, did you want to add to that? Yes, let me unmute myself first. Oh, we <laughs> so, hear you. Good, thank you. Uh, so th this question of how fast can we get this technology and the roads, given that it takes probably 10 to 15 years to replace a car park, um, it, it comes very often. Um, and we at Ford have been um, thinking about it for, uh, well, I would say for the last five to 10 years. Um, and one of the solutions that we are offering to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to the society and to, to our industry is uh, the use of smartphones in vehicles using a technology that we call AppLink which allows uh, a phone to be integrated into the vehicle infrastructure. Um, it, you, can, you can basically display um, safety messages that would pop up otherwise on a phone inside the, the vehicle head unit. Um, and this technology, um, uh, we have offered this technology to the industry as open source. Uh, we called it SDL, and we already have a number of car makers that have been uh, adopting it and uh, implementing in, in, in their in their vehicles in their brands, um, we think that that plus the ability to have uh, infrastructure communicate with vehicles in that way um, will address some of the challenges that we we, we anticipate as as uh, uh, in the ramp up of this technology over time. So, for example, in the case of the uh, um, uh, animal on the road, um, if if that uh, crossing is some is uh, is a place where we often see animals. Um, I can envision one day putting some sort of camera um, in that vicinity and allowing that camera to communicate with the cars, informing them about um, an imminent danger of something on the road that the car cannot see because it's it's not close enough. So th these two technologies, uh, what we can do in the infrastructure and what we can do with smartphones inside vehicles. Uh, will allow us to, I think, address some of this challenge of how do we accelerate the uh, introduction of V2X technologies in vehicles. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Charles, do you have a question of the panel? Charles Lee from the Audubon, Florida. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, when the Wakaiva Parkway was designed, there was the necessity of providing for non-tolled local traffic, as well as the toll lanes for the expressway traffic. And that resulted in, I believe, north of $300 million in additional expense to construct the additional lanes. Um, now that the electronic tracking of vehicles has become much more prominent, and we have in place a universal uh, system of transponders as well as toll by plate. And both the responders and the toll by plate function can be linked to the addresses of the owners of those vehicles. 
Uh, it seems to me like it would be possible if we co-locate a major tollway with the location of an existing highway that a system could be implemented whereby we would not have to build those extra toll-free lanes, but instead we could use electronic tolling to separate so that local traffic on the same road would not incur a toll, but through traffic to other destinations that passed over the same road surface would at the same time incur a toll. It seems like there could be some pretty large cost savings in that. And I'm just wondering if our panelists could comment on the possibility that we're at a point when we could implement something like that. Yes, Jovan. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, if, if you think a little bit about it, um, a car that's on a road, um, it, it knows pretty much everything that, um, that a gantry would have to figure out by observing uh, the car as it goes through, uh, through, a, through a line, um, uh, the gantry line. Um, the vehicle knows what lane it's driving at, it knows how many passengers it has, it knows exactly the location where it is. So as, as, you, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, it's very, very possible for, uh, for a, to, to come up with a system where that information can be communicated to some sort of infrastructure um, much, much in a much simpler way than we have today with, uh, with tolling operations. Um, uh, a roadside unit alone can actually serve that purpose. Um, and that's that's a future that I think uh, we should be exploring together uh, because I think it's very, very possible with the technologies that we have today in vehicles and also with some of the work that uh, FDOT has been doing with infrastructure. Uh, definitely a possibility in my mind. Thank you, Jovan. All right, Kent Wimmer with the Defenders of the Wildlife. Do you have a question for the panel? Hello, this is Kent Wimmer with Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I have a couple of related questions. My uh, two of them. My first is, please describe how technical innovations can lessen the need for building new highways or expanding existing highways. All right, Trey first, and then Dr. Lilly. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, the you know, these technologies have great promise. Uh, it will take a while for them to roll out. What we expect is we see, we expect to see the safety benefits very soon, um, much sooner than the mobility benefits, um, because some of the tech, the safety applications um, can, can be very easily used in a mixed fleet um, when you have non-connected or not autonomous vehicles mixed with others, uh, other uh, CAV or autonomous vehicles. Um, the mobility benefits will take much longer because of the mixed fleet. And you and you, we could actually see because of the uh, technology and having to be conservative, for example, the headways between vehicles um, could actually see the mobility benefits uh, taking uh, much longer to, to get out there. So, we look at um, the technology as adding value to the um, infrastructure and helping us to manage the infrastructure more efficiently. Um, and we think that's gonna, gonna happen and uh, will be a big benefit. Thank you. Dr. Lilly? Yeah, I, I completely agree with, uh, with what Trey said. And just to add that the um, in simulations we've been doing with uh, mixed traffic, autonomous, connected, conventional, uh, we don't see huge uh, benefits in terms of uh, capacity. Uh, we get numbers around 20, maybe 30 percent when you have a fully automated uh, uh, fleet uh, based on the assumptions of um, headways and spacing between the vehicles that we that we have today. Now the, the 
and, and this is what we uh, believe is going to happen in the next uh, couple of decades. Now, in a hundred years, maybe the headways will be much, much shorter than what we anticipate right now. And maybe at that point, um, we will have huge capacity increases, but uh, but I don't see it in the in the near future. And may actually go in the opposite direction, um, especially in the short term, as vehicles autonomous vehicles keep longer distances between themselves. Okay, thank you so much. Kent, did you have a clarifying question for the question? Uh, no, I was I was hoping that uh, these technologies could incre increase capacity sufficiently that we would need these new roads. But uh, anyway, I have a second question. Um, can you please describe how DOT will use technology to detect wildlife, to reduce wildlife and vehicle collisions, which enhance public safety and reduce wildlife mortality? Great. Raj, do you mind taking that? Thank you, Christine. Absolutely. Another great question. Uh, yes, as Trey was alluding to earlier on, the same technologies which we have today, and they're advancing significantly by the day, the same technologies can not only detect a pedestrian as easily as they would a bicyclist, but also any moving and actually even immovable objects. So fortunately, with technologies such as LiDAR, for instance, you can map every little pixel or an element of an, on a roadway corridor. And then with all the forward-looking infrared detection, the camera detection, there are numerous sensors that are already out there being pioneered by the industry every single day, which can detect uh, a pedestrian, particularly wildlife, for instance. And when that information becomes available, there is a way to communicate all this information to the drivers who are coming into that particular location. So for example, there's a deer crossing or wherever the deer cross, wherever the animals cross, there's a way to detect their presence and communicate that information to drivers. So where there is no information today, for instance, somebody may be driving at a certain rate of speed and there could be an unfortunate situation of a collision, but with the information being made, made available, when the vehicles are equipped with these onboard units, as Yohan was referring to earlier on, there's a significant way we can improve the safety of every single being out there, including including the animals at large. So, so we, do, we do believe that the, the capabilities exist. It is only a matter of making it happen. And corridors like these, if we can start planning these type of technologies into projects like these well in advance, we'd be saving not only a lot of money, but we'll also be advancing safety from day one of implementing this quarter. So yes, in short, the technology is there. It is just a matter of implementing it. And as we go forward, forward, we are looking at these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioner Carnahan, do you have a question of the panel? He's with the Citrus County Commission. Uh, no, I don't. I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, for, for the presentation and um, just keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We have James the, Mayer with the uh, business plan because it's not part. We're going to come back to uh, James in just a minute. And Michael Napier with the Department of Health, do you have a question of the panel? Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Cerency with the representing the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Do you have a question of the panel? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Trey, you were talking about the frame, the regional uh, networks. Uh, could you go back to that um, and maybe show the slide and uh, describe again what, what that does? Sure. Um, Christine, do you want to show the slide or you want me to just talk to it? Um, why don't you start talking to it? I don't think we can go back at this point, but um, we mm -hmm. will make sure we get that slide to you, Matt. Okay. Okay. I'll pull it up here on my my computer and, and um, if you can refer to it later. Um, but there's quite a few uh, CAV applications on the frame projects. And if we talk about I-75 in particular, um, so some of the applications uh, that when we talked with the um, local um, agencies in those areas um, in, in Gainesville, for example, 
um, there was a, quite an interest in transit signal priority. Um, in Ocala area, there was quite an interest in freight signal priority. Um, <clears throat> the overall goals for either are, are the same, and it's, and it's trying to give um, use the connected vehicle technology between the vehicles and the traffic signal infrastructure to help give uh, a, a priority to either the transit, the bus, or to trucks. Um, and so that's that, those are very promising applications that we think uh, will be pretty near term. Um, also, there is um, signal phasing and timing uh, along the corridors, uh, along the arterials of I-75 and at the interchanges. So the, that will give um, in-vehicle messages, safety messages to drivers. For example, um, if you're um, sitting at a uh, red light, and it, it can give you a countdown um, until the green so that there's minimal loss delay uh, with getting vehicles moving. Also, the same type of messaging from the traffic signals can give um, information of red light warnings. If, uh, if a connected vehicle is approaching and another connected vehicle is approaching and it looks like uh, one is not going to stop um, for the red light, not going to be able to stop, not going to stop, then that can give a warning and even potentially extend uh, the red time so that there's not um, collisions, um, those type of applications. So there's a, uh, with the, once you get the connected vehicle technology into the vehicles and the roadside units that Raj talked about on the roadside and at the traffic signals, there's many different applications that can be communicated back and forth uh, with the auto manufacturer partners. Hope that, hope that helps a little bit. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And for all the panelists, I mean, for all of the task force members and the public, all the presentations will be uploaded on our website. So we'll be able to, you can capture them there as well. So next, um, I'm going to ask Jim Patton, do you have any questions? Jim is with the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. Not at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ashley Stefanik. She's representing Warren Zwanka with the Suwannee River Water Management District. Ashley, do you have any questions of the panel? I don't have any questions today. I just wanted to thank the panel um, for the great presentation. Thank you. Next, we have Frank Gargano. He's representing uh, Jeanette Seacrest, who is with the Southwest Florida Water Management District. Frank, do you have a question of the panel? You are self-muted if you can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Um, I do not have any questions. Uh, I'd just like to thank the uh, panel for some interesting and enjoyable presentations this morning and thank them for their time. Thank you. Next, we have Jeff Prather with the St. John's River Water Management District, and I apologize again for the oversight earlier. I don't have any questions. I, I would too uh, thank the panel for their presentation. Thank you. Mike Woods with the Lake Sumter Metropolitan Planning Organization. Mike, do you have a question of the panel? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for a great presentation. It's so exciting to hear about connected and autonomous vehicles. Uh, so we've worked for over the years uh, integrating connected and autonomous vehicles into the existing infrastructure. But our task force is, you know, considering a new corridor. What kind of physical improvements or refinements can we expect on a, a new corridor that's designed to accommodate connected and autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, on the physical infrastructure? All right, Raj, I'm going to ask you to start off, and Trey has offered to kind of follow up. Yep, I'll make it real quick. Another great question. In fact, when we think about uh, planning for projects, this is the type of situation we always would like to have. In an ideal situation, we'd like to have a brand new corridor, which can take into account not only the infrastructure needs, but also what all technologies are available out there. And fortunately, over the last few years, Florida DOT has been making significant advances in not only understanding what the technologies are, but incorporating them. So if you look at the intelligent transportation system, 
Florida DOT happens to be one of the national leaders. And uh, there's no other state like Florida when it comes down to the fiber optic backbone that is being established on the freeway systems, for example. We can do a similar exercise with a project like this. So incorporating the communication backbone is going to be key to getting emerging technologies implemented for the larger safety and mobility goals of the state. Secondly, taking into account what all technologies are out there, going beyond the corridor. So corridor is, happens to be only the main artery, so to say, but there's so much everything else that happens all around, whether it's the economic development or the benefits the arterials are going to gain, advanced traffic signal controllers, which we need at the end of the day to get the smooth traffic flows in both recurring and non-recurring congestion. So uh, designers who get into designing projects like these when they're aware of technology implications and thanks to your leadership from a policy perspective, if that is allowed to happen, then we can incorporate technology today and get the safety and mobility benefits almost on day one, rather than retrofit them in the future, which is not only expensive, but we would have lost a lot of opportunity time-wise in terms of saving human lives and promoting mobility. So um, uh, infrastructure provisions are there. We just need to include them now from a technology perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Trey, did you want to add something to that? Uh, thank you. Raj covered it pretty well. I think the only thing I'll add is um, one of the things that uh, particularly autonomous vehicles need is uh, good, good pavement markings and good contrast for those markings. So um, obviously with a new facility, the markings are going to be uh, to the latest standards and in very good condition. So that, that will provide uh, great capabilities to um, autonomous vehicles. Thank you. Excellent. Next, we have Valerie Hancher with the Ocala Marion County Transportation Planning Organization. Valerie, do you have any questions of the panelists? Um, kind of, yes, ma'am. Hey, thank you for everybody. And I have to say, I was giggling thinking about the cars trying to miss the squirrel. Um, so I could just see it going back and forth. That's my morbid sense of humor. Sorry about that. But question, I, you know, Marion County as a whole is a very rural area. Um, and I'm also, in my other life, a real estate agent. And I know some areas like we have the phones that have we can unlock doors you know with our automated keys but we can't always get the service how is that going to play in when you're driving through the you know the, the forest or different areas of wherever you are in florida with these kind of cars um and the technology that they're going to need for their who's next to them when they need to stop and those types of things Yovan, I'm going to hand it off to you to answer Valerie's question. Um, a really great question. Um, it also highlights um, our interest in some of the developments in cellular technology, which allow us to do direct communication between devices. Um, if, if you think a, a little bit about it, the reason why you have uh, low coverage is because uh, carriers typically don't have a very strong business case to put a cell tower um, uh, in a place where there, there aren't too many consumers of that cell tower. Uh, what these uh, connected vehicle technologies allow us to do now is to have a vehicle communicate directly without a vehicle, without a cell tower. Um, I can also envision a situation where, because of safety reasons, FDOT may decide to put a roadside unit that can communicate with vehicles directly without uh, uh, needing to have a cell tower or data plans. Uh, so, uh, just to reinforce my point uh, that I made uh, during my brief introduction, um, with cellular technologies today, we have these two modes. Uh, in, in one mode, the, uh, the vehicle talks to other vehicles through the network. Um, that means that there's a cell tower somewhere close by, there's backbone fiber that connects that to a data center and so on. That's one mode which is very important. We have that today in cars and where we have good connectivity that, that's very, very useful. But the other mode, which is really the exciting developments in this technology, is the short range communication, direct communication that's the, that does not require the cell tower. 
So we think that we can address many of the problems in uh, rural areas uh, with technologies like this, uh, where uh, for safety reasons or for local reasons, we may have, uh, we may have a good business case to put in uh, some sort of road infrastructure um, that does not necessarily bear the cost of having a full tower and, uh, and a, ba a backbone network that comes with it. Hopefully that um, helps with the uh, answer. Excellent, thank you so much. Next, we're gonna see Sean Sullivan with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. Do you have any questions of the, of the panel? Uh, Christine, I thank you. Uh, I don't have a specific question, but I'd like to make a comment that um, in Pasco County, the farm at Epperson uh, Residential Development is uh, under construction, actively under construction, and it's known as a connected city, and the technology is state of the art. Uh, so folks who might be interested in some of that technology might want to Google that. And there's a whole lot of information on the Pasco County website. Uh, and I'd like to also thank the panel and thank FDOT for your continued excellence in this uh, endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll call on Bradley Arnold of Sumter County. Bradley, do you have a question of the panel? It's not a question necessarily of the panel um, because some of this, the presentations were good. A lot of this has to do with timing of deployment uh, on existing infrastructure as well as what would be proposed under the new infrastructure and how much capacity would be gained through the technology on the existing infrastructure and how would that you know, relate to the, the new corridor capacity. So that's just a statement, um, not really a question because I know that's something that would be um, DOT would have to run the analysis um, in the future once technology starts getting deployed. Excellent, thank you. Phil Fulmer is representing the Florida Trucking Association. We talked a lot about the trucking industry as part of technology. Do you have any questions of the panel, Phil? Um, Christine, I, I, uh, I guess comment and a question from the gentleman uh, from Ford. Um, the technology connectivity uh, with the cellular, do we know or do you know yet uh, the uh, the trucks, the over the road, I deal in big trucks, over the road trucks, and right now the safety uh, stuff that is available in trucks and cars obviously makes it almost impossible as you're going down a road just to have a, have a wreck to run into anybody intentionally. So this cellular connectivity and stuff that you spoke about is that um, also being put into the uh, over the road trucks yeah so uh, i'll take that question since it was directed to me um, there is uh, there's absolutely no reason um, um, not to have the same technology in trucks just like in cars um, the technology is completely agnostic to how it's applied uh, in fact we we envision uh, the same technology being available in um, in scooters and bicycles uh, and also in uh, cell phones um, which will allow a much wider um, communication capability between these different actors on the road um, so so the short answer is yes absolutely it's a possibility um, obviously it's a it's a matter of uh, application and uh, and the individual stakeholders have to make their decision uh, on, on a um, one at a time, essentially. Uh, we cannot do that for them. Thank you, Yovan. I'm gonna open it up for Chris Saliba from the Florida Rural Water Association. Do you have any questions of the panelists? I do not, it's been an excellent presentation so far and I appreciate the opportunity to be part of it. Thank you. Next, we have Bill Ferry with the Florida Internet and Television Association. I hear some connectivity uh, with what you do with this panel. Sure. Um, yeah, my, my interest is, you know, what type of backbone um, are, are you exploring? There's a lot of, you know, obviously we have cellular, we've mentioned that. There's fiber in the ground that connects um, poles and lines, but you also have 5G and other emerging technologies like satellite, like Elon Musk's satellites that he's sending on. Maybe ask the panel generally, what are you seeing? What promise do you see in some of these emerging technologies and how does it all fit into uh, what we're looking at uh, doing with some of these uh, these features that, that go with the roadways? Thank you, Bill. 
Dr. Lilly, we haven't heard from you. Um, there are seven different technologies, and Yvonne mentioned before the um, it's what we call the dedicated short-range communication uh, or DSRC. Uh, we have uh, wireless Wi-Fi, um, and those are the types of technologies we're testing here at the intersection um, in Florida, just to evaluate um, how they work under under different uh, circumstances. But uh, it is my understanding that not all of them require uh, the the same type of uh, of infrastructure. But uh, we're trying to be flexible in terms of the types of communication capabilities we're we're looking at um, here in Florida. And so there are options for for uh, one technology may work better in one environment and another communication technology better. So. Thank you. Next, we have Danielle Ruiz with the Florida Economic Development Council. Danielle, do you have any questions? No, I, I did enjoy the presentation, but I do not have questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kurt Williams. Kurt's with the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. Do you have any questions, Kurt? Good morning. I don't have any questions, but uh, would certainly like to thank the panelists for their time and the excellent presentation. Thank you. Dr. Sider, with the uh, Lake Sumter State College, do you have any questions? No, I do not. Thank you. Paul Owens with Thousand Friends of Florida. Do you have a question for the panel? I no, Thank you, Christine. I do have a question. Um, I do want to say that that this process, I think if we're going to continue on the webinar approach for a while, we should have a more efficient process for questions than simply just running through and polling everybody whether they have a question or not, um, since we want to be as efficient with our time as possible. Um, my question is kind of a follow up on what Kent Wimmer said earlier. Um, and that is, do any of the technological improvements that we have seen today depend on the construction of new roads or can they be added to existing roads? Is it necessary to build uh, an entire new network of roads to accommodate these or can they, as Raj said, uh, optimize the existing road network? Is there anything that we talk about that, that you have to have a new road for? Yes, Raj. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. And, and we think about the same question all the time as well. Um, technologies, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, is purely an add-on. In other words, it can only bring about benefits from what is already out there. So. As somebody was saying yesterday during the panel discussion, unless there is a roadway network, there's not going to be movement of vehicles or pedestrians or bicyclists or any other mode. So the basic premise for any good transportation system is the presence of a roadway network. And all technology can do is become an add-on. And as I was mentioning earlier on as well, when we build a new roadway like this, it is always a great idea to incorporate technology at the front end. And we've been seeing all along through the decades that unless we have a good transportation system, technology can only do so much. Take, for example, the fiber optic network or the intelligent transportation system. All it does is help us to make the finer adjustments of an existing roadway network or obviously a new roadway network. So a basic roadway network becomes a necessity for the movement of people and providing the safety and mobility provisions at the end of the day. So without a good roadway network, technology in and of itself cannot and will not be able to do anything at all, if anything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Jason Lauritsen with the Florida Wildlife Corridors. He's in and out of um, some audio right now. Um, I'm going to hand it over to him first. It looks like he may have, we've just lost him. But um, he, he forwarded a question or a statement. He said, um, let me make sure, Jason, can you hear us? He, he asked, Raj, you mentioned an app development and panther speed zones and bear crossing areas. Sensors are also needed. Integration of these elements is a positive approach. 
Jason stated that he would love to see smart vehicles and smartphone apps that can collect and assess crowdsourced data to plot wildlife presence and be used to assess needs for speed reduction, signage, fencing, smart alerts, and maybe full-blown wildlife crossing installation. Jason, can you hear now? All right, Raj, can you ad address that at all for Jason? I, I, I think it's a great comment. I mean, it really is because uh, technology it does, one of the basic things technology does is exactly that. It collects the presence of people, collects the presence of animals, collects the presence of anything. And once we, I, I, it's really good to hear the term crowdsource. Once we get all the data in, then traffic engineers and transportation agencies can actually start making some decisions. Where exactly do we have these crossings, for example? Or where exactly should we have these crossings, for example? How do we start responding? Are there certain patterns when these movements take place? So once data becomes available, there's many ways in which we can analyze and draw some meaningful conclusions based on which state agencies make decisions. So I just say it's a great comment, and these are the type of things uh, as emerging technology folks, we should be tackling going forward. So thank you for the input. I mean, I made a note of it. It's a great piece of input. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have two more task force members that we haven't called on quite yet. Zach Prusak with the Nature Conservancy and then Hugh Harling. Um, and then we'll go back to James Mayer after that. So Zach, do you have a question of the panel? Zach, can you hear us? All right. Hugh's been having a little bit of audio troubles as well, but we'll unmute him. Hugh Harling with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. Do you have a question of the panel? Uh, I have a statement and a question. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, one of the, the, the statement that I'd like to make is that the computer traffic uh, analysis that goes on and has been going on for 20 years has increased the safety and the uh, ability to use uh, maximum flow through intersections uh, for for a much more efficient operation and it is probably the best bang for the dollars for money to be spent to increase the uh, trafficability in in almost all areas the next thing that I have as a question is that uh, one of the gentlemen stated that uh, the uh, uh, technology would require uh, certain improvements in paving and uh, cross crosswalk analysis and things like that for uh, everything to work properly. And from a maintenance standpoint of view, how often would that be updated? Right now, DOT doesn't update those things unless they're doing a resurfacing, which is usually about every 17 years. And I think that there are a lot of intersections that need to be uh, maintained at a higher level than they are right now in order to uh, reduce the number of accidents that occur because of the inability to see uh, crosswalks, inability to see uh, the, the paint striping, crosswalks for schools and things like that. So is there is, is maintenance being included in the discussions that are going on? Thank you, Hugh. Trey. Thank you, Hugh, for that question. That's uh, a, a really good one. Um, and you're right, the uh, maintenance is an is a important component. Um, the good thing is when we talk to these um, auto manufacturers and technologies companies is they're, they're, these are redundant systems. So they're not completely uh, dependent on any one sensor or type of sensor technology generally. Um, so they're not, if there are, is, is an area with bad markings or if there's a construction work zone or bad weather, there's all kinds of real world um, challenges that they'll come across. Um, they're not only dependent on, for example, a, a machine uh, vision system. 
Um, but what they do tell us is well-maintained infrastructure, crosswalks, for example, like you say, or other types of markings helps with their ability to um, predict um, the movements of the vehicle and give them a, a greater uh, level of safety buffer. So while they're not dependent on it, it does help their, their systems operate better. So um, when in Florida, we, we strive to uh, maintain the infrastructure at a high level. And uh, the great thing is these things that we're talking about um, have great benefits to human drivers, just like machines. So we, we take an approach that we prioritize uh, the maintenance benefits for the human drivers and they also have the same benefits to the machine uh, machine vision and other autonomous systems. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. Yovan wanted to add something. Uh, yes, and um, I don't want to take anything away from what uh, Trey has mentioned already. I think those are uh, right on statements. Um, I, I want to just add uh, that these new emerging technologies are providing us with new opportunities of how we can look at these problems. For example, um, I can I can see a future where we don't need any markings because the markings are being delivered digitally um, through these connectivity technologies. Um, in fact, I've heard I've heard a statement at, at one of the uh, DOT meetings that digital is the new asphalt. So as we start thinking more about that paradigm, I think we can start coming up with some very interesting solutions that um, uh, were not available to us just a few years ago. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why we at Ford uh, really like to work with um, organizations like Florida DOT, because uh, we, we really need to communicate with each other to understand where this world is going, where the infrastructure is going, and where the uh, automotive technology is going because it's at the intersection of those two that we're going to find these opportunities that will help us solve problems in new, um, more effective ways. Excellent. Thank you. I did want to go back, James Mayer, if you're available with the Florida Department of Economic Protection. Did you have anything in yeah, addition? Yeah, A question? All right. So it appears as if that concludes our our panel conversation. Um, does anyone, we're inviting, we've got a little bit of extra time if people would like, if there's a clarifying question that you'd like to ask, you're welcome to raise the virtual hand on uh, the GoToWebinar. If, we, if some of the conversation may have instilled another question that you wanted to follow up with. Charles Lee, I see that you have a follow-up question. I'm unmuting you. Yes. Um, thinking about, again, the subject of co-location, and I, I'm going to shift the scene a little bit. I know that we are the Northern Turnpike Task Force, but to illustrate the point, I'm going to point to US-19 as it might relate to a Suncoast item. But I think the, the answer really would reflect sort of the same notion. Uh, if you were to have an expressway system that used an existing road like US-19, and throughout the rural segments of that, it were more or less a traditional limited access expressway, but when it approached the town, let's take uh, Perry as an example, um, it would lose its expressway characteristics and then turn into a urban surface road, would it be possible to expedite and better control the traffic through that urban surface road section by better coordinating using the systems you're describing, the signalization, uh, so that uh, even though you came down off the expressway platform at the edge of town, uh, that when you actually pass through the city, because of controlled synchronized signalization, you would not lose so much of the traffic flow continuity. That's my question. Is that a is that a feasible uh, thing to integrate looking at the availability of these kind of systems? 
Great, Charles, thank you. I'm gonna hand it over to Raj to answer. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we could not have picked a better example, sir. In fact, the, the exact same situation you, you presented is what we were discussing right after the recent hurricane responses, right after Florida DOT uh, took significant steps to understand how local roads work or rural agency uh, roads work. So that's a great question. And, and the reason why the question is important is because during emergency situations, as an example, or even during routine operations, it is the rural corridors, it is the corridors where traffic signals uh, may need attention from, shall we say, traffic signal experts as such. So upgrading the traffic signal infrastructure, which is a major component of emerging technology platforms, is going to help not only to monitor traffic at that particular intersection or the entire corridor, but also optimize the traffic signal timing. In other words, give as much timing as possible where the need exists. And when we equip these intersections with the already existing technology called SPAT or signal phase and timing, as Trey has indicated, has mentioned earlier on, we can tell what amount of green, yellow, red times are available and advise drivers well ahead of time. It also improves the queue, queuing system, for instance, uh, each vehicle can in and of itself become a probe. So as was as earlier on, we can crowdsource this data and well in advance inform the drivers coming into the intersections and the pedestrians or the freight or the transit along that corridor about what is happening all around. So we cannot find a better example than the one that was presented when it comes to implementing emerging technologies and getting the maximum possible benefit from day one. So yes, technologies exist. And in fact, these are the cutting edge areas and probably where the needs really exist to leverage technology. So um, we think that we can do it going forward. Thank you. Dr. Lilly, you wanted to follow up? Yeah, just to add to what uh, Raj said, the uh, one of the last slides I showed in my presentation show exactly that is the detection of vehicles as they arrive um, and the development of signal timings that would correspond to those arrivals so that we are able to minimize uh, travel time. So definitely those technologies are exactly suited for that. Excellent, thank you. I have one last task force member that has their hand up and it may be from earlier. Kent Wimmer, did you want a follow-up question? I did. Um, this is for DOT. Will DOT commit to employing technology to reduce wildlife and vehicle collisions? I think that's a great question for us to maybe follow up on as we work through the guiding principles and the ultimate project. I don't know, Weiwei or Will, did you want to follow up? Yeah, thank you, uh, Kent. I think we can certainly explore whatever technologies and continue to improve on them so they can support the guiding principles and uh, any conflicts that, that you're talking about. But, um, you know, there's there's a lot of different solutions out there. Why, you know, why shouldn't we look at technology as part of that solution? Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Well, that concludes this portion of today's presentation. I want to truly thank the panel for being there and everyone's patience as we had some technical difficulty. I did notice that there was a, a, a citizen that had raised their hand during that last go round. We're going to uh, next we will move into public comment and hopefully we'll be able to hear from you then. So I'm going to hand it over to Christina Colon, the co-chair. All right. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'd like to recap a few of the next steps before we begin the public comment period. Uh, first of all, uh, today's presentation, the webinar recording uh, will be posted on the website. Second, we anticipate scheduling another webinar during the first week of June to discuss broadband. Finally, we will be in touch as soon as we have a sense of the timing of future in-person meetings. So this concludes our formal presentation for today. We will now move on to the public comment period of our webinar. I want to continue to emphasize how important this input is to the process and that public comment during our meetings and webinars is only one way for the public to provide their input to us. 
public comments may be submitted at any time to f.listens at dot.state.fl.us and will become part of the public record. Let us now hear public comments from members of the public who signed up to comment and are on the webinar with us today. Christine. Thank you, Christina. Okay, so let's go into our public comment period. As I mentioned earlier, we've received 19 requests to provide public comment. We think that will take about an hour. And as always, we encourage everyone to stay engaged during this portion of the webinar. Requests to comment were received by five o'clock yesterday and will be addressed during the public comment period in the order the request was made. If you do not respond when you are called, we will provide a second chance at the end of the public comment period. We will identify the next three speakers so that you may be prepared to comment. When your name is called to actually speak, we'll unmute your line in order for you to provide comment within your allotted three minutes. You will hear a tone when you have 30 seconds remaining and then another tone when your time is up. The line will be muted after three minutes, so please keep your eye on the clock and listen for the tones. If you have more information to share with the group, you can provide additional comments in writing for further consideration. You can send comments anytime to fdotlistens at dot.state.fl.us. Only one person at a time will be unmuted. If you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. So with that, we have the next, th the first three speakers. We have Ryan Smart of Jacksonville, Florida, Lindsay Cross of St. Petersburg, Florida, and Kim Wheeler of Williston. Ryan? Next up is Lindsay Cross. Lindsay Cross from St. Petersburg, Florida, you are unmuted. Good morning, this is Lindsay Cross with Florida Conservation Voters. Hope you are doing uh, well this morning. Uh, today we are asking DOT to halt the MCORS process until it could be done in a more transparent manner that encourages meaningful public participation. Webinars and private phone calls with task force members reek of bad government and a sham process. At the April 29th Northern Turnpike webinar, the success rate for giving a public comment was a dismal 21%. Only 29 out of 130 participants who had signed up were actually able to speak. Frustratingly, many sat on the phone for hours to give their three minutes of comment, but were unable to get through. Of those that were successful, all 29 spoke against the roads to ruin. At the same webinar, there was no mention of this second round of webinars. Instead, DOT had discussed how in-person meetings were preferable and would likely resume in June. Members of the public that had proactively signed up for meeting notifications were not alerted about this meeting until five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. In the meantime, there have been private phone conversations between DOT staff, consultants, and task force, mem task force members to solicit feedback on MAPS. Those discussions are not available for the public to listen in on, and important background materials were not provided prior to that webinar either, making it quite difficult for the public to review and provide meaningful feedback. Attendance for this webinar is lower, and that includes both task force members and everyday Floridians who are concerned about the devastating impacts of these roads. That is why Florida Conservation Voters has started a petition to halt this process and already more than 900 people have signed on. We feel that this project is bad for our water, wildlife, public health, rural communities, agriculture, and taxpayers. It deserves to be fully vetted, not rushed through when people's lives and livelihoods are threatened. Proceeding with the Roads to Rune project as is in a time of unprecedented crisis is an act of bad government and a waste of our taxpayer dollars. We respectfully ask that you put the brakes on the MCORS process and allow the 2021 legislature to revisit this project when there's more information regarding the anticipated and severe budget shortfalls that we will experience due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you all for your time this morning. 
Thank you, Mrs. Cross. Up next is Amy Datz. Amy, from Tallahassee, Florida, you are unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can, go ahead. Okay, my name is Amy Datz. I have been a professional environmental scientist for over 40 years. And I would like to look at this project through E cubed, which is energy, environment, and economy. The energy we hope I hope that this will uh, the there will be solar powered generation and charging for trains, buses, and cars. This will advance the 2040 100 percent renewable city, county, and state plans. There will be a great environment is number two. There will be a great reduction in air pollution through congestion management, wildlife crossings, and reduction of stormwater and septic tank pollution, as well as by bicycle and pedestrian alternatives. Economy, there'll be increased movement of freight and services. Currently, we waste $5 billion in trucking congestion. This is passed on to the public. If this, this project will also help to reduce childhood poverty and unemployment, providing over 700,000 Floridians with internet. In addressing my, my colleague from St. Pete, yes, the 700,000 people who will benefit by this project and who would like to be lifted out of poverty and like to be lifted out of low, uh, out of unemployment, they don't have a voice in this. I'd like to hear from them how they would support this roadway. I think this roadway will be a roadway to a better future in Florida. Now, in terms of the autonomous shuttle, I was excited to see that. That is something that we could sanitize in between uses so that somebody doesn't have to worry about getting into an Uber that is full of coronavirus uh, bacteria or viruses. We, we can actually sterilize the shuttle in between uses without harming anybody. I would like to see, uh, to make the comment that 43% of Florida counties do not have internet, good internet connectivity. This internet connectivity will help to improve the quality of life through telemedicine, through school, uh, teleschool education, and so on and so forth. Uh, today, people, wait a minute, all toll facilities will have solar energy capabilities, expanding the system along the corridor. I imagine there will be solar charging stations at the exits and solar powered strips in the roadway that will allow for charging for electric cars, buses, and trains on the roadway. I'd like these to be portable solar charging stations. Please ask your legislator to support. Thank you, Amy. Next up is Michael McGrath. Michael? You are unmuted. Good morning. My name is Michael McGrath. I'm organized with the Sierra Club based out of Fort Myers, Florida. We currently find ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. As of yesterday, there were close to 41,000 cases and 1,735 deaths from the coronavirus over alone. Many people are currently fighting for their lives or are worried about protecting themselves from immediate threats that COVID-19 poses. The ability to consider long-term environmental threats such as the proposed toll roads is extremely limited. As task force members and FDOT staff, we must consider the state of emergency we find ourselves in and respond accordingly. It is ludicrous to expect a normal public engagement response during this planning process. I urge each of you to consult your conscience and ask yourself this question. Why are we still rushing our, rushing our process to build a series of toll, tollways that will permanently change the character of our state for generations to come in the midst of a global pandemic? There's simply more pressing needs in our communities that should be the object of our attention. It is unnecessary to rush a planning process that will have immense environmental impacts and fiscal costs. Even a perfect webinar with no technological glitches cannot replace an in-person public hearing. This is inherent to our values of democracy and our constitutional right to assemble. Simply put, these webinars are a far cry from what democracy looks like in action and blatantly fails to provide meaningful opportunities for engagement. If you really value the public that you intend to serve, then you call this m course process off immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGrath. Up next is Herman Younger. 
Herman, you are unmuted. Hello, my name is Herman Younger. I'm the organizing representative based here in Gainesville, Florida for the CR Club. From the beginning, the M course process has been opaque and fruitless. These webinars have further highlighted the recklessness of this pursuit to build toll roads that only benefit private interests and polluters. FDOT's claim that it values the input of the public is a poorly disguised facade. The overwhelming public outcry against these toll roads has been ignored and covered up. This process is undemocratic and Florida taxpayers deserve better. This is highway robbery. We urge you to change direction now. The only legitimate option is a no build recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Younger for your comment. Up next is Kimberly Heiss. Kimberly. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you're unmuted, go ahead. Hi, um, I've spoken at almost every webinar so far and yeah, there are quite a few less, peeps or quite, uh, less people on now than there were um, last time and uh, fewer task force members uh, as well. And it just seems like we're going in circles. Last time I um, spoke, I uh, had been recording the comments that people were making um, and I emailed the task force members, uh, a list of everyone's comments. Um, I recorded like over a hundred comments and um, you know, it's, there's not much else to say at this point. Uh, you, the task force members that question the need for roads in order to implement these technologies, uh, you're absolutely right. We have, there's no need for anything. Uh, the, to the person who, uh, I think it's Amy Dax who spoke earlier, um, you seem to really like renewable energy and that's, that's great, but um, we don't need a road in order to have these sorts of things. And this road, the only thing this road is gonna do is is going to increase the population in Florida and that's not something that we need especially when we're talking about climate change and we're talking about the need for re renewable energy um, if you think people are going to be moving inland uh, you're probably right but they need the funds to do that and the keys uh, in places that are being flooded they're buying out people's properties for a low for a low amount just so people can have a little bit of money to, to move and to resettle from these places and and we need money to do that it's a, it's a, it's a this is a catastrophe. This is not something we need to be built business as usual kind of roads for. So this is I, I, it's a commendable that you like renewable energy, but this is just not the project. And it's not even the main reason for the project. This road was pushed through the legislature by somebody who is connected to toll companies. There have, they have those people in mind. The idea that they have renewable energy in mind is ridiculous. And what internet has to do with any of this has, is ridiculous as well. Um, People have said uh, that you need you need internet in order to participate in these meetings and to you know participate in school and everything. Obviously, that's more important than a toll road, especially one that goes through the Florida Wildlife Corridor, which is like the last remaining green space we have in Florida. I mean, how is that going imp to impact climate change to get to in, to influence people to move here from from other states and create urban sprawl throughout the area and basically you're going to be you're going to be urbanizing all this area where we have grasses and trees and you know that's our carbon sink in Florida so I don't know how you how you plan to ameliorate that effect um, this northern corridor also will heavily impact the Florida black bear who lives in isolated pockets um, in the state and this is the last chance that we have for the black bear and the Florida panther is to keep this Florida wildlife corridor intact. We won't Thank have anything. Thank you, Ms. Colson. Your time is up. My apologies. Thank you, Ms. Heiss. Up next is Michelle Colson from Ocala, Florida. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. You are unmuted. Okay. Uh, Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this uh, webinar and speak. Um, I have been a part of the last webinar and like others have said, there is not enough public interest in here to um, even continue with this, um, th this project until the public is able to join these meetings in person. Um, I, my name is Michelle and I live in Ocala, Florida and I represent hundreds of young voters who oppose these toll roads that we call the M-Course process. As you know, 
These toll roads will destroy large parts of Florida's last remaining rural lands and communities. They will pollute our waterways and threaten and endanger wildlife like the Florida panther and the bear. Um, building these roads is completely unsustainable and it is definitely not something that is needed. Uh, why, why are we thinking about even just even doing this when destroying hundreds of thousands of additional acres of land and wetlands will be the result of this? I highly doubt that the technology that you guys spoke of will keep our bears and panthers from getting hit on these roads. There's millions of old cars out there that will not have this technology and adding an app to this so-called technology to help with this is completely absurd. Adding an app is ridiculous. You're talking, you're telling people, oh, we're not allowed to text and drive, but sure, go ahead and download an app that's gonna send you different text and different things that you can then read to make sure that you're staying safe and you're not gonna hit that panther. You see how ridiculous that sounds? Um, as well as the fact that, like so many of us have already said, this has been passed through legislator through somebody by somebody who is directly impacted by these toll roads and who's only going to benefit from this. So definitely not something that any of us want. I completely and 100% oppose this toll roads as many of my fellow young, young people. I've spoken to many of them, um, some of them who cannot be here right now because they do not have internet um and would be at these meetings if they were done in person so we oppose this toll road we ask you to please halt this as soon as possible and focus our attention and our taxpayer dollars to something better than toll roads that are clearly not needed thank you thank you miss colson We have 13 individuals that aren't signed in a manner that we can recognize their attendance or not on the call. So that concludes our public comment period. With that being said, this also concludes our webinar. Thank you for your attendance.